25. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. For Fishing the DMV to survive through 2024 and beyond, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 25 Patreon subscribers away from that goal, which is absolutely crazy. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, you can keep Fishing the DMV alive and well. All Patreon members will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month. You'll be entered in weekly prize giveaways, membership to our private Facebook group community, and you'll also have access to private live streams, videos, and so much more. If you think you can help Fishing DMV continue on into the future, please check out the link below or click the link above my head. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live, January 29th. This is the absolute miserable time of year, unless you're a Floridian. God bless you. The only time that it's actually great to be a Floridian is about this time of year. Everyone flies south for the winter, except for us that have a day job <laughs> that are kind of stuck here right now. But we got only about a month and a half, maybe a little bit less before the BFLs and all of our local derbies kind of start back up. So we're through the fishing show season, at least for me. Next year, we're going to be doing a little bit more. I think we're going to go to Raleigh uh richmond and then we got a couple more we're going to do next year as well as each year the fishing dv gets bigger we're also going to increase the amount of shows that we're going to do uh next year just for some house uh next week for some housekeeping stuff we will be at the dale city fishing show uh we're going to be at the dale city fishing show i believe we're going to be right next to the cabela's booth as well just to give you just some information about what's coming up there the other thing that we have is next week we have a big announcement for the show we have another partner another sponsor coming on to actually help up the show a little bit so just to kind of keep that information the other thing is for people i know people always say like well it's too loud or too low uh this will be re-uploaded and when it's re-uploaded i will increase the volume i don't want to blow out the speakers during the live stream at Richmond, I cranked up the speakers so loud that when I listened to it this morning, you could hear me breathing. So just to let you know, try to turn the volume up on your end. It really helps me out. I don't want you guys to actually hear my eyes blinking. That probably wouldn't be too good. But anyway, yeah, next week we have a special announcement that we're going to be making. This Saturday, if you want to come down to the Dale City Fishing Show, come on out. And then you guys know how these live streams work on Monday nights. You ask a good question, you get a prize. That's how this thing works. I'm like Mr. Beast in the in the world of bass fishing. Well, poor Mr. Beast, because they're not it's not a lot of money you're gonna get, but you're gonna get something. So without further ado, we're not here to talk about me. My special guest of the night, the 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 legend, Sheila Johnson. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a long time coming. Yes, we've been talking about it for a while. We finally got made it happen. So I'm happy to be here. I think everyone knows who you are that's in my chat right now, but for the three people that don't. Uh, how did you get involved in this crazy, this, that is the fishing world? Oh, well, I've been fishing. I grew up in Front Royal, Virginia. So, um, I'm, I'm coming up on half a century year old. Um, so I've been fishing <laughs> since, uh, I was about 15, um, on the Shenandoah river with my, with my stepfather, um, you know, catching Helgamites and worms. And, um, I just kind of followed it along throughout the year throughout the years with my ex-husband, you know, we fished a lot and that's kind of when I got into the artificial lures and then we divorced and um, I still had the passion for fishing. So I would be bank fishing a lot. And um, then I kind of, you know, on social media saw some friends that that got into Lake Manassas where you're not really supposed to get into um, catching big ones. I said, well, how, how did you guys get in there? And they said, well, we parked on 28 with a kayak and went up the Creek. And I said, Oh, that's brilliant. That's so cool. <laughs> I don't suggest doing that. They will, they will, uh, they do police it. However, um, it just opened up to me like, oh, I can now get off the bank and fish. And so I, I asked for, uh, uh, my first fishing kayak and it was a $300 sit in 10 foot Pelican from Dick's and it had a rod holder right in the front. So I was excited about that until I joined some other groups and went out with some other folks, um, that I still fish with today. And they just had some amazing, kayak rigs and we're moving a lot better in the water than I, you know, was and and then picked up the love for snakehead fishing. And that's kind of, you know, where I was. I, I fished a lot with those folks and they said, you know, you should start doing tournaments. I was like, no way. I, like, I'm a girl. I'm not going to compete with the guys. And I said, I started with some online tournaments and I did okay uh, or did pretty well and then started let's, let's go, let's go do it all. And my first one was a MAKBF tournament on the Potomac river. Um, and it actually, did would have taken first place except i didn't know i had to have the zero line marked 
Um, oh. And I got a, yeah, it was a three inch minimum. Josh was there for that. Uh, so I got a one inch deduction for each fish. So I ended up taking second place by three quarters of an inch, losing to Jake Harshman, who took my spot. So. Dang, it's a, it's just, it's a small I know it was, it, I still say, Hey, I want it. You know, Jake says I, you want it too. I said, well, then give me that money. <laughs> uh, I, I would love you guys. Like I, so one person I follow, which is a guilty thing is like when Scott, Mar Scott Martin does his, like his house demos of all the people. I would love all of you guys to share a house because the story has got to be amazing. Just listen yeah. to you guys banter. Yeah, it, it, it's happened. <laughs> I mean, anywhere we're at, we just kind of get back at each other. Jake Jake has his, his feet uh, fetish and wants to take pictures of our feet. So uh, one of the funny things is whenever Christine Fisher and I are together, because she has way bigger feet than I do, uh, we always take feet pictures and send them to Jake, and he just has a blast with that. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about my following either, because I think that video specifically, that little clip on Instagram has like over 10,000 views. Y'all are sick. I don't know what it is with you guys and Jake, but yeah, <laughs> to each their own, I guess. Um, I, and you know, we're it's just going to have them. To, it's easy to mess with them. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to get inside his head. And entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> Jake, if you're listening, you know what we're talking about. Um, the first question to derail the conversation, which I was going to bring this up anyway, it was from TP. Question of the night, what's your dog's name? And this, we got, I feel like this is part of your brand too. Your Great yeah. Danes. This is Ghost. Oh, come on. This is Ghost. He is a blue <laughs> Harlequin Great Dane. I'm hi, gonna... honey. Can you say hi to everyone? Yeah. So he's usually always with me, but yeah, he's a blue Harlequin great day. And he will be four at the end of um, March and he is about 125 pounds. Big, big baby, obviously. And big mama's boy. <laughs> and no, he does not go in the kayak. I tried when he was a puppy and he was not having it. Did, did you, so my mom's great Danes didn't like swimming in general. Do great Danes just not like the water? No, like the typically like the big barrel chested, dogs they don't swim very well and um you know i did go to a friend's property in lake anna and their dogs were all over in the water i bought them a life jacket because they it sounds silly but I, I don't want my dog to drown um and it was the first time they really got into the water but um he got in there and as soon as he couldn't touch the ground he was freaking out towards me and his big velociraptor claws went down my my thighs so I'm just going to say he, he does not mind the water as long as he could touch the ground and his head's above it, but I don't Baby. think he's going to try to swim. How so. much does he weigh? He's about 125. Oh my goodness. Yeah, he's, he's, he's actually not that, not a big one. He loves to make appearances on my work calls. So this is not nothing new for him. <laughs> and then how many do you own? I have two. And then we have two pit labs. My other one's name is Clark Griswold. And <laughs> um, we just got him. He's, he's about a year old, but he just got his, his tail um, amputated because he got a happy tail injury. Oh, baby. Uh, yeah. So sadly we couldn't heal it. So he has to, had to get it amputated right after the holidays. We're pretty sad about it. We got, we got Vicky. We'll, we'll, we'll have the puppy podcast right here, right now. Uh, pity did, uh, pity, my pity did the same thing once she couldn't touch the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Like some dogs, man, they just do not take after the water. Yeah. And these guys are just clumsy as it is, but he likes walking around in the water. Like he, you know, he went to the women's fishing federation event with me in uh, Indiana, right outside of Louisville. And, you know, he kind of freaked out when I went out in the kayak, cause I was trying to film and take pictures of the, um, the water recovery, um, with one of the ladies They she, she volunteered to do a water recovery and go out of the kayak and teach her how to go back in. So he was on the, on the, on the bank and he was like running up and down, like freaking out, like, where's my mom? Why is she out there? And uh -huh. yeah, but yeah, he's no, he's not going to be done. <laughs> <laughs> Tell Patton. So, so he's good in about eight to 10 feet of water. Uh, the legs aren't that big, but yeah, they're, uh, they, they, and if you guys don't know great Danes, I grew up with them. My wife didn't, my, my wife had a bad experience with them. I've only had positive ones that they're such sweet animals, generally yeah. speaking, even though they're like, they're massive. Yeah. They're very gentle. The, the one thing I really wanted to kind of just to circle back to, you go from fishing in Front Royal, which is a, in in the terms of fishing world, it's not Gunnersville, it's a humble beginning, sort of speak. Yeah. To, we were talking off air about like flying out to Texas for a woman's retreat and kayak fishing. Mm -hmm. A lot had to have happened between point A and point B, did, and yeah. so 
the first time that you fished like Manassas and saw Jake's feet to the, the fact that you're flying out to Texas, like how did all that take place? Um, I, th I mean, mostly social media. Um, I've been doing this for probably eight or nine years now. So I think when I started into it, there really weren't a lot of women into it. I mean, we're still trying to get a lot more women, but it's, it's, it's grown a lot. Um, I think there's an intimidation factor. Obviously that was my first reason why I didn't get into in-person tournaments because of, you know, I was intimidated by the men. I didn't want to embarrass myself. Um, but um, I think social media did a big part of it. And I wasn't out to be like, Hey, look at me. I'm, you know, I want to get sponsors. And I just posted what I love because it was just fun for me. And I wanted to share that with other people. Um, you know, I've been doing it for a really long time. I just started doing it to where, especially when I started kayak fishing, I, I posted a lot of pictures when I was bank fishing, but when I got to kayak fishing, I mean, I really just got completely obsessed with it because it, all those times that I was on the bank looking out to where I wanted to fish. Now I can get to all those places and fish and fish in the banks where I was standing, which makes no sense. But, um, you know, it just kind of opened up a lot of doors for me. I, I think because there weren't a lot of women at that time, um, only a handful of us that were on social media, it got a lot of attention. And, um, luckily it got, you know, some good attention of some sponsors that I'm, I'm still work with today. Um, you know, I've gotten to a point where I work on some production, um, some of the products, uh, the production of some of the products. Um, oh, cool. um, yeah. So like the black pack pro, I had some comments on that. And, um, there's another yak attack product that's coming out that I've got here and I've been testing and giving feedback on. And, um, but yeah, I think social media was a big part of that. Um, and while while there's more women in it today, um, I've kind of taken more of a stance that I want to promote the sport for women. Um, and that's why I am part of Women's Fishing Federation. Um, the Fly Fishing um, Expo, they came to me and needed someone to speak. They have a, a separate, this is the Virginia Fly Fishing Expo. Um, they have a separate uh, class for the Women's Fishing um, Symposium um, and asked me to do an intro to uh, kayak fishing um, class for them. And I brought in, I went out to Backyard Boats, borrowed a Hobie inflatable by Trek 11. Um, I borrowed Herschel Walker, or Herschel's um, Jackson Mayfly, which was great for fly fishing and, and took those to the event. And then Bo uh, Beasley, um, I said Herschel Walker, Herschel Finch, um, came up to me and said they, they had a lot of complaints after the seminar. And I was like, really? Like, what happened? And he goes like, all the men were really mad that you didn't do your kayak fishing class to, to the public, only to the women. So this year I had to do it to both. So I had to do a session to the public on Saturday and one on Sunday. And so he really wanted to, he, had, he does the same expo down in, in, um, in Texas and wanted me to come down and, and, and do it there. But there was a conflict with the kayak fishing event at Jake's, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, and I had already kind of committed to that. So I got that covered by one of the other um, lovely women, Carol Wells, that I work together with at the Women's Fishing um, Federation. I had Bradley on, uh, I think it was episode oh, two, 207, I believe. Um, but she talked about from the boating side of things, fishing the Bassmasters and things like that. And, and this question, I really closed my eyes and I wrote down before this conversation was, how much did the kayak industry help women opening that up and having kayak tournament fishing? Because I think of you and then Christine, like there's so many big sticks in the kayaking world. And I really thought it's like, well, is that because it's like, you don't need a $150,000 bass boat? How much does that help? Because Nolan Miners, another dude that I know, it helped his career out tremendously yeah. having that. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the biggest thing for me and why I was so drawn to it. Because when I was with my ex-husband and we fished, we had a John boat and then, you know, we, we were out fishing on the Aquapon Res, or, I'm sorry, not the Res, but the, the river in Aquapon. And we were out in a John boat and we were getting pushed around by all the boats. We went straight to Prince William Marina and bought a 14 foot bay liner. And then we were still getting pushed around. And then we bought, you know, a 30 something foot sea ray. And, um, but that's kind of a lot to, to fish out of. And then, you know, when we broke up, we, when we divorced, I didn't have that option. So I was stuck in the bank. And, and again, that was fine for me. But when I discovered that there was kayak fishing and I could do it on my own, because my husband now at that time, 
today's a different story, but at that time, 20 years ago, he, he was an athlete. He was not outdoors. He did not want to touch fish, worms, nothing. Um, and so it was something that I was able to handle this 30 foot kayak and just throw it in the back of my car and go do what I love to do. Um, and then I got so obsessed with it that it just kind of grew, grew, grew to where, you know, kind of where I am today. How, how did you get hooked up with, uh, Jackson? Um, so I was with Bonafide at the time and I was at ICAST actually. Um, and I was, I'm sponsored with Torquedo as well. Um, and I was working the, the hi Amy, um, hi Russ, was working the Torquedo booth. And um, as soon as I got there, uh, Jameson Redding's boat was in there, his, his red NAR, and it had a Torquedo rigged on it. And Richard Penny, um, who works with Jackson was there. Um, fantastic guy. And I was just amazed. And I was actually thinking, you know, I was in my head, trying to maybe go the Hobie route anyway. I needed a bigger, I need a bigger kayak. I needed something wider. Um, the fish that I catch, the snakehead that I catch, I need kind of more of like an open cockpit to allow me to, to have some room to do some of the stuff that I want. I want to be able to lay my board down, you know, um, for tournaments. But I, I was impressed. Um, the tri track was nice. I mean, I love the open platform of it. I wasn't crazy about the the weight of it, but you know, I went from a thirty pound up to kayaks that weigh more than I do um, at this point now. So now I have a, I have you know a double um, double bunk trailer. Um, that's not a problem. I, I prefer wet launching and having to carry my kayaks now anyway. But I, I I expressed a lot of interest in it. He's like, okay, if you if you were interested, like tell us what you want. Like we we'll bring you over to Jackson. And, um, I guess that day went on the next day I walked in and, and the folks from dugout bait and tackle, um, uh, Jamie and Steve Owens, who runs the BASS kayak. He's, he's a team manager for dugout and Ryan Lambert, good friend of mine. Um, he's the, one of the hosts for, uh, KBM cornered me and said, if you want Jackson, we'll take you, blah, 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 you know, kind of worked all that out and made a, I said, well, to be honest with you, I've never really even been in the Jackson. I've not been on the NAR. I can't make that decision to you because I don't know if I like the kayak. And I called Josh while I was there and talked to Josh Evans, who's on. Um, and he had a NAR. And I said, hey, when I get back, is there any chance that like we can meet up? I can you know, test drive your NAR. So see if I actually really like it because I don't know that pedal system. I don't know. You know, um, I wasn't in it just to be like, hey, thanks for this kayak. And, you know, I, I really want to make sure it was something I wanted to put some time in. And, and it worked for me. Um, which I think is very important when you're choosing a kayak. And it's one of the things I talk about in one of the classes, but um, I absolutely loved it. Um, I didn't have a motor on it. I, I, um, I pedaled that entire day. Uh, he took me out in Maryland and we had a great time. And it, and it was that point that I reached out to them and said, yeah, I, I'll make the move. Um, and I've been extremely happy. Jackson has been um, a wonderful family environment. I've known a lot of the folks already for, for many years. Um, some of them I fished the Pan Am tournament with. Um, so a bunch of the folks are local. I fish local tournaments with. Um, and um, the team, I mean, before Jameson left and um, Dustin Nichols, some of us are on other um, teams together, such as Torquedo or Yak Attack. And so you just become a family with some of the teams that you're on. Um, so it made it really easy to make that decision. What is Pan Am? Um, Pan Am is the, the Pan American Kayak Championship was a tournament that was put on and it was um, North America, Central America, and South America countries competing against each other. Holy shit, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So um, that took place. Eric Jackson, who uh, was the owner of Jackson Kayaks, and he is a whitewater um, Olympian. Um, there's Jean. She's on the Jackson team as well. Um, she's she's a phenomenal woman. If that's one woman you need to have on your show. She is she's a Florida and gets those double digit ladies. Um, but yeah, so he he started this and in, in hopes to with the whitewater kayaking being an Olympic sport, he wanted kayak fishing to be part of an Olympic sport. So he was working with CIPS um, and started with the the Pan American. So I think we had I don't know how many countries we had. We had uh, America, Canada. Um, Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, Costa Rica. Jeez. Yeah, we had a bunch of countries in. Um, Jackson provided kayaks to the countries that, you know, um, needed kayaks if they flew in, um, provided rods, reels, baits, whatever they needed. Um, that was held in Center Hill Lake, I think 2019, maybe. Maybe Jean remembers. Um, but we took, I took, um, the ladies took the gold. Uh, medal and I took silver in the women's event. Um, so that was nice. 
yeah, so that was nice. And now, now there's the world's kayak championship. So I compete for team Philippines on that. So how I'm half Filipino. So I USA and then Filipino. Yeah. So much there. So like while yeah. this whole Jackson deal is going down and you're doing the Pan Am games and are, are you fishing, I guess at that time was the Bass Masters having a kayak series? Was it just Hobie? Like what tournament or series were you doing? Bass Master might've really been very new. Was it new? Back then. Yeah. I really did KBFs mostly. I've only been doing Hobie ones for a couple years just because I'm so in love with my torpedo and my motor <laughs> being able I, you know, I have carpal tunnel and I don't pedal or anything a lot. So um, yeah, it was 2019. Um, it was funny because at, at the time of the Pan Am, I did not have a pedal kayak. Um, so Jamie Dennison, who doesn't really compete much anymore, but he, he was, he was a hammer. Um, he was on the Hobie team and he had just gotten another Outback. He was in a PA and he had an Outback and he said, you can, you don't have to bring your kayak down. You can use my uh, Outback while we're here. And I was like, great, you know, cause we've got Ron champion. We had Chad Hoover, you know, we had a bunch of great folks on the team. Um, so I go out, we take off, you know, they do the America, the national anthem and everyone takes off at the same time. And, Here's the kayaks all go. And I'm like, I start going and I'm, you know, on the of this Hobie thing. And I'm like, man, why does everybody make it look so easy? I'm dying. Like I couldn't get anywhere. And I went all day. And later on that day, the wind picked up. It was like 15, 20 mile power winds. I'm not in my favor of where I was pedaling. And I got done at the end of the day. And Jamie's like, so how'd it go? And I'm like, dude, that was the most miserable experience. <laughs> <laughs> like what the heck why do you guys all make like i and i just watched them all take off and they were all just pedaling like talking to each other and then remember this is a brand new kayak you know apparently there's a screw that you're supposed to loosen oh shit. To the tension and when he was he got in it to test me was, i don't know how you did that all day and i'm like <laughs> <"Help me up." laughs> well, the next day i was like oh yeah i'm good i look like everyone else <laughs> apparently yeah Doing the tour like of France going out to the there, gym and putting the highest weight on, and I did that for eight hours that day. It was brutal. Oh my god, <laughs> yeah. that's freaking insane. Forgot he forgot to change the tension on it. Yeah, I think there's something like with the other kayak anglers I've talked to. I think there's something like when you go from a boat to a kayak. I think there's definitely a learning curve. But when you just are completely in the kayak realm, you don't have to deal with that issue. So you can all your gear is completely set up to the nines. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like there's a lot of people in the boating realm that are nervous for the crossover. So if you are a boater that want to get into the kayak world, is there any suggestions on gear or setup just to make the transition easier? Um. Well. I think the bigger your kayak is, the bigger, more stuff you're going to bring, right? But the more stuff you bring, the heavier your kayak is going to be. So if you're, mm -hmm. if you're pedaling or you're paddling, that's more weight that you're going to have to paddle. Even if you go to a power option, that's still more weight, right? So you're going to, you're going to lose some speed, use more power on your battery um, to, to push more weight. So less is definitely more. Um, and then your storage options. So, you know, Yak Attack makes great storage options with the, um, with the Black Pack. Um, that comes in multiple different sizes. A lot of the kayaks, fishing kayaks nowadays have, you know, forward or rear hatches that you could store things. And I do that a lot, you know, for things that I'm not using um, consistently, like, um, uh, it, you know, uh, plastics. Um, I'll keep like my main plastics, you know, in my black pack, but I have a big Plano box full of um, and some roll up um, Z series uh, roll ups of plastics in my front hatch that I'll access if I need to. Uh, especially for tournament days. If, if, if I'm at like snakehead fishing, then I'm pretty much using the same things I always use. So that's not a big deal. Uh, deal. But uh, I do a lot of storage in, in there, um, in the front hatch. And and just, you know, it's just like going into a bait shop. It's like, ooh, oh, I need to have all this. But you really don't. Like bring what your what your confidence baits are. Um, and then maybe in a, in a couple of different colors. Um, but th I think that's the biggest for me. I mean, Carl Jacobson just competed. Um, you know, one of the elite, uh, bass. yeah. And he just, he just came in the top 10, but you know, you listen to his, 
his speech at the awards and he was like, I pedaled all day. He didn't have a motor to keep him in position or anything like that or, or to help with that and with, with the winds. Um, so it, it, there's an adjustment, but it's also, it's like working out. Like my friends are like, you want to go join the gym? And so no, my gym is on the water. Like if my time's coming soon. <laughs> so yeah. And I've had a couple of conversations about this before with, with what Hobie did. Cause I thought there is something very pure when they cut out the motors, but, and again, not for all, it was their option. I'm not saying you did that for all the things. It was just interesting. Like everyone's got a, everyone's got a pedal. I think, I don't know. There's something very pure about yeah. that. Um, oh, there's Steve Chaconis. I was waiting for you to get in the chat here. We got so many questions for you here. We got Shane Flynn first. This is a good one. How many rods do you carry in your yak in a tournament? Because I think Carl had like 57. Like, how many do you generally carry? <laughs> um, probably around 10. I can hold eight in my black pack. Um, it could be 10 to 12. Because we have three rod holders on each side that that go into the parallel to the inside of my kayak uh, for tournaments. Mm. Yeah. Because I don't want to, I don't want to spend time changing baits. Um, you know, changing I, if I could just pick up different ones. Like I, I throw jackhammers a lot. Those are the colors I throw. So I'll have three or four rods rigged up with jackhammers, different colors. We yeah. got okay. We got our first. In the beginning, it was winner. just one. <laughs> but now I'm tournament fishing. It's it's a lot because I don't I don't want to spend time doing that. So because I I, I I run straight braid because I fish the Potomac a lot and I fish a lot of snakehead fishing. So I fish the Potomac a lot. So, you know, if I'm out fishing the Susquehanna, like the night before, I have to run leaders on all my stuff. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Ugh. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I know the chat, you're going to get insatiable at this. We will be talking about snakehead fishing. Do not worry. Uh, Bassin with Big Malone, if I got your name right, uh, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. You guys know the deal. Ask a good question. If I pick it and I make the announcement, you win. Uh, uh, reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook, or email me to get your gift card. What's your favorite fishing style or technique? Top water. There we go. Top water. Top water and jackhammer. I mean, I can't, I don't know. I, it's jackhammer on the Potomac through the grass, swim jigs, um, until the top water bite heats up and it's top water the whole time. Yep. I keep we it. Got... Cool. We got Steve. Steve doesn't want a gift card. Sorry, boss. But then I'm going to put this one here. <laughs> Not that I would use a kayak, but curious about the rod length. Does fishing out of a kayak affect rod length and length choice? Not for me. Um, I mean, I, I, try, I tend to stay around the, you know, seven, three. Um, it, it doesn't, the only time it, you kind of have to fish a bit differently is, so I, you know, I tend to cast like to my right side and you just want to make sure there's nothing back there. Like I'm not hitting my motor or anything like that. Um, but you get used to it. it. Just takes, it just takes some time to, to get used to it. You guys are just, but, and, and, and it's funny because I side fish a lot. So when I go, fish on my friend's bass boats. I'm like, like I fish with Ricky Lambert and I've hit him in the, in the butt with my swim jig one time. Cause it's just, I'm, I'm always like, I can't do this. You know, it's cause I'm so used to doing it that way. And then I think it's vice versa for people from the, the bass boat world that come over to our world. And I'm going to piggyback off Steve's because like, so as you guys know, I've been dabbling in the kayaking. I'm actually going to get into it more. I don't know if I made that announcement yet, but for this year, but that'll come. Um, the first couple of tournaments I fished, my crankbait setup is very, is dialed into where I set the hook and I take a couple of steps back because that's what I fished through college and high school. Mm -hmm. Well, when I took that same setup to kayaking, I had a lot of fish throw the crankbait and it didn't click for me to like, it was too flimsy because I couldn't back up immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Steve, I do get your question. If you guys are listening that are on a boat, yeah, you got to definitely think about making sure that- well, We need a, a, did, maybe a, a faster reel, yep. reel faster. And then, you know, if you're in the standing position, try to keep your rod tip down. Yep. 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 Like yeah. it's just, but it's so interesting because like, it took me a while to think, think that through is it like, it's mm -hmm. just that little thing, that devil in the detail. Yeah, absolutely. How, and, and guys, don't worry, we'll get to different. all your questions well, I here. Skip, I can skip baits from my kayak, but I can't skip them from a boat huh. yeah. because I'm, I'm skipping from a, I'm already down low to the water. If I'm standing, if I'm sitting right. And I, I to, to get to the dock, it, it just, I can do it. It just takes, I'm so used to just doing it that way. I have to make those adjustments. I think it's actually better to go from a kayak to a boat than a boat to a kayak. Um, Nolan Miner talked about this and it stuck with me so much. I, I fished my whole season based on this, which is when he went to a kayak, he said, you don't truly appreciate how many fish you fish over until you're in a kayak where you don't have a 250 to leave. 
And he partnered that up with LiveScope. And yep. it really made me appreciate like, yeah, you got to pick an area because you can't hit 57 points in a kayak. Yeah. And you got to fish it. Yeah. It's you're forced to learn how to fish that water, especially like the first time I fished Gunnersville. Um, I fished it with Dylan Lowry uh, for the national championship. And we, I mean, we pre-fished and then, you know, we went to that spot that we pre-fished on, on, um, on a tournament day. And, you know, it, it, he was at one and I was at another, it wasn't working for either of us. So we were like, let's pick up, you know, load our boats. So on tournament days, if, and, and I think that happened with, um, Jackson, I think this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, at the Hobie one, but if it's not picking up on that day, you can't just rev your motor up and go all the way up to the top of Gunnersville. So he, we have to load up and spend, I think Dylan and I spent 45 minutes driving up North to get to the top of the to off top of the lake uh, to fish. And we're, we're able to catch fish there. Um, but sometimes those are the moves that we have to make. I mean, even though if we both had a motor, um, this is for the, the KBF national championship, we both had a motor, but there was no way we would have made it up there in 45 minutes. We would have ran all the battery out anyway. So how much does fishing for snakehead and fishing tidal water help with that? Because it, it, it's how you fish tidal in general is you got to be willing to sit and camp in an area. You're not running and gunning, generally speaking. Couple that with snakehead, which is kind of the same thing. That's really got to fill into that. You got to fish an area hard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think with because the advantage of tidal water, if you understand how the, the tidal water works, what the fish activity is with water, uh, with tidal water, and where those just very minimal, if call them whatever you want, but channels are um, that are just different enough that it creates some kind of passageway for the fish to go in. Um, those those spots will reload. So there's a spot that I fished um, the tournament that my first uh, in person tournament, I sat there and I fished it and it just would keep reload. And I picked 17s and 16s and 17 inch bass out of there. Um, and then, you know, in 30 minutes, it may not work anymore. Um, so I would just go to another spot because I know which way that, the, the, you know, that the fish are going. Um, I think that day at that tournament, um, there was half the field dropped out by noon. Um, they, they went out of Pohick and went right to the mouth. Um, and that's fine, um, but I prefer to be in really skinny, soup, you know, smaller water. And I know those waters back there. I know where the fish travel. I bumped into you at Pohick. I think it was last yeah. year, mm -hmm. and that was during the whole uh, the whole drama on the water with the uh, the hull sailing, I believe, with the netters. Yes. Was, was that it? Because I think you were the one that sent one of the videos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you had just posted something with a commercial fisherman, and I go. I think they're here. Let me go talk to them. And I actually really enjoyed it. I sat with them and um, learned about it a lot. And they actually gave me all their snakehead. <laughs> they gave me 30 something pounds of snakehead that oh day. God. Yeah. Um, so, and they were, I have an AFCO bat. So whenever I choose to harvest them, um, I'll either strip the gills or use the, use the bat. So they were like really in, you know, intrigued with my, my AFCO bat to, to, just carrying a bat with you. <laughs> but yeah, it was amazing. Like just, just to see the number of shad and the goldfish and the size of the turtles and the blue cats they were getting, or just any of the cats they were getting out. It was it was it was pretty cool to watch. Were they and, and I know that the drama beforehand that happened up at I don't know if it was Chickamuxin or wherever it was, but there they had left a lot of shad floating afterwards. Um, but I, I watched them clean up and, and take off and I didn't see anything left over. So but and I think that's a good thing for all of our bass heads in the yeah. comment section is like the, the, the conversation was cordial. It wasn't abrasive or anything like that. Exactly. No. Yeah. Not for me. No, they, they were like, you can come with us commercial fishing anytime. So, <laughs> <laughs> so S Steve, I can already hear Steve typing up his keyboard right now, but I love you, Steve. Um, we got so many questions. We'll get through some of these questions. So we keep going here. Uh, we got Shane Flynn outdoors. What electronics are you running on your kayak? So currently, I'm not running anything because um, I broke my transducer off. Um, but I typically run a, a Hummingbird Helix uh, 7 Mega SI. Um, when I was fishing at the Women's Fishing Federation event uh, in Indiana at the Sporting Club, I was not paying that much attention when I was trying to push my kayak because I couldn't um, wet launch it from one of the ponds that we that was on the property and I tried to like push it and the transducer I didn't realize got caught and I just heard a wire pop oh. so my transducer popped off um so I just needed to eat I, I want to I want to get a um upgrading and go to a Garmin um live scope soon anyway so 
Yeah, that's yeah. That's but the one of the Potomac. Like, I never even use it. So, and that's the problem. Like with a lot of our waters around here, is like yeah. it, unless you go to a lake that requires it. Like if you're just fishing, well, the Res or Mooney, then yeah, I'd use it. But other than that, that's why I'm not in a big hurry. Uh, we got Steve again. What speed reels do you use on a kayak? Um, I typically stay in the sevens and eights. Um, I do run a Revo rocket, uh, with the 10, uh, real high speed. Um, and just because, you know, Abu, uh, pure fishing is one of my sponsors and, um, I had to, um, you know, you use a lot of Shimano Corrado reels, but I, I had to, uh, get a lot of the Abu Garcia reels. And, um, I was like, Oh, this is probably overkill. I don't need this one. And then I love it. I love it for top water. I mean, I can pull up a buzz bait with just a few turns of the handle. Um, I think just that and with my frogs, I love it. I haven't used it much for like deep water jigging, which I think would be effective if I was able to need to pull one up quickly. But uh, for top water, I absolutely love that reel. But um, yeah, I, I don't really go with the lower speed reels because I think if you go higher, you can always slow down to slowing your, your crank around. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't really speed up a slow one. So that's just kind of my philosophy on that. And then guys, we've got another question. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna get through all these. We got we got so many questions. We already have, we have compared to this and Instagram. Again, a stream yard. If you could get Instagram to like transfer everything over, it'd be awesome. But I got Instagram up on the other screen. We got 70 people watching right now, which is is absolutely awesome. So I want to make sure we blast through all these questions. We got crappy Kev. Crappy Kev here is like, what not uh what not does she use? Alberta for leader. Alberta not. Boom. FG takes too long. Alberto, I can do it in my sleep. I do agree with that. I I joke with my co-angler because I usually start with the, the FG and then as soon as I break off, I go to the Alberta and he's like, why don't you just start with that? And it's like, honestly, I'm just too stubborn. Yeah. I try to be fancy. Yeah. Uh, and I, I can see everybody's doing it. They're like, do, 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 do. You know, and I'm like, I yeah, forget that. I'm like, da, 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 done. We got Dylan. Dylan, time management was the biggest learning curve for me. Dylan's uh, time management is he catches all his fish on pre-fishing. <laughs> oh, oh, damn. Sorry, Dylan, I love you. <laughs> uh, boat to kayak was rough. Yeah, that, that is definitely a heck of a learning curve. Uh, let's see. We've got another one here from Jeremy Smith. Most competitive kayak series in the DMV? Question mark. Oh, gosh, I can't answer that. Uh, MBKBA and MAKBF. I mean, I think MAKBF is is comprised of anglers in a, in a much broader area. So you have more people fishing. I mean, the 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 um locations are a lot bigger and then no you haven't till locations are a lot bigger and then um it brings in tournament anglers from you know delaware and pennsylvania so um i, I don't know that's tough and yeah the, how many organizations are there in the area um i think there's a new one it's like chesapeake bay kayak anglers i think they might have you know push out to like upper bay and stuff which is where makbf is um so i think it's just those three really i mean but kbf you know, like with some of the tournaments that come here, well, at least like in the Susquehanna, um, like B Hobie was partnered with MAKBF uh, for that tournament for the past several years. But Hobie is not doing Susquehanna this year, but BA, um, the Bassmaster Series is, the Bassmaster Kayak Series. So that'll be a partner event. And there's a lot of partner events. Um, so like with the KBF Potomac event um, on the title Potomac, it it's also partnered with you get to like triple dip. So if you you do the KBF tournament, you can also do the MVKBA tournament. You can also do the MAKBF tournament. So you just pay the tournament fees for each one. And if you do really well, you get paid out in three, three different ones. If that makes yeah. sense. To me, and we've got so many people talking about this here. This is an interesting question. Like, and, and uh, Josh has, and Bassmaster has partnered yeah. with MAKBF this year for the Susky. From just an organizational standpoint, I think it's whatever trail has the most variety. So, because I always, to me, it comes down to AOI. I think AOI will always be, no matter what type of fishing you're doing, is the most prestigious thing you can do. And if you are just on the title Potomac for 10 events or the res, that is not a really good like qualification Absolutely. of that. Yeah. I know MVKBA this year, they have two smallmouth events. So it's the Shenandoah and the Potomac. Mm -hmm. I think if if when Hobie did that and you had the New River and you had the Susky, that gave you that nice variety to where if you were AOI, damn, you, you earned it real, yeah. real good. Yeah, I think that in order to be considered a good angler, you have to be a versatile angler. You have yes. to know and understand how to fish a bunch of different kinds of water. And I think all of us could still are still learning on that because I can fish. I, I'm a shallow water fisherman. So I like skinny water. Um, and then I go out to Center Hill Lake, which is a hundred foot 
plus lake with, you know, um, with bluff walls and I suck. Uh, you know, I don't know where those fish, I can't, I don't understand how to, to, um, you know, to fish that type of area, but it's not like, I'm scared of it. I'm still going to try to learn. And, 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 you know, every time I go out, I, I learn about it. Um, you know, with the, with the, with the world's fishermen, we're supposed to go out to Italy next year. Um, and the, in the following year we go to Zimbabwe. I mean, wait, wait, Zimbabwe's got like bass, really? <laughs> I mean, but it's not always can be bass. It could be pike, and it could be just different species oh, out of okay. our main lakes. But they're all part of um, of the world fishing. So yeah, That's the guy who runs the MLF uh, for Zimbabwe uh, is tied in with U.S. Angling. That's so freaking cool. Uh, yeah. What's the coolest place you've actually gone to go fishing? Or that stuck out to you the most? Um. I think my favorite place, to be honest, is Miami. Just like the canals of Miami. Not oh. even like out there. Just because you never know what you're going to get. Um, oh God, the first so time cool. I went down there is I was working for a company that was based out of Doral. And I I, hooked, I booked my hotel um, to be very close to the canals. And so the I was at a courtyard in, in Doral that the the there's a Pepsi plant behind it. And then the, the canal just runs right behind it. And uh, so when I got off out of my meetings, I would just go walk down the canals. And um, I didn't realize there was a huge iguana craziness during around that Pepsi plant. So that kind of freaked me out because there's some really big iguanas there. Um, but that's, you know, I just that's how I got my first peacock bass is just walking down and sight fishing it. Um, how big was it? I don't know. I didn't I didn't bring a scale with me. There's a picture of it somewhere. Um, but there was, it was a pair. It was a, it was a pair and I couldn't get them to bite, to be honest with you. I was throwing everything at it. I went to best. I went, I didn't bring a lot of fishing stuff with me. Um, but so I, I would go down to Bass Pro that's there and buy a bunch of stuff. And then I just donate it, um, to the tackle shop for any kids that come in. Um, but I, it was hitting, it was bumping all my plastics. Um, like the, the male was, he was like head butting it and I was like protecting it and get, getting him away from his, his lady. Um, so I threw a crankbait on <laughs> like a little 1.0 KVD crankbait. And then I just kind of snagged it. Um, and I was like, well, it's, I caught it. Uh, I didn't snag it because he bumped it and, you know, but he didn't bite it. Um, Stand then caught, and then, you know, then I caught his, his, his lady on a <laughs> So it's like, Mr. Steal your girl. Um, but that was cool. And then I, another time, um, I had a friend, um, who was on one of my pro teams down there and I, I got into a mess of, uh, of a fish that it was an amazing looking fish. I didn't know what it was it had a mouth, like a crappy, but it was some weird spots. I didn't know what is my, I don't, I have no idea what hmm. this is. And I caught him with jerk baits. I got into like a ball and caught a bunch. And I, I sent him, I'm like, okay, what is this? Cause I don't know what this is. You know, I, I, I know what the peacock bass and the cichlids and everything else. And it was a jaguar guapote. And I was like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's just cool because you never know what you're going to catch down there. Oh, um, sure. Same with offshore. Like I go I go like way offshore um, with a friend of mine that um, he used to be one of the veterans that fish or active duty guys that fish with Heroes in the Water when he was here. And then he, he got um, moved down to Tampa. And so he sold his Hobie when he was down there because he, he's going to fish the big water. And I still fish with him when I go out there because my best friend lives so he's taking me like 60 miles offshore and we're, you know, vertical jigging 100, 150 feet of water. You don't know what's going to come up. Everything's just fighting you really good, you know, and then you you start catching like vermilion, which are like bluegills to us. Like, oh, God, waste of time, you know. Um, yeah, so, cool. so it was fun. It, it, yeah, I, I think it's when you don't know what you're going to catch. Yeah, that's, 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 what's that's interesting to me. That's the one thing about bass fishing that kind of gets... I, I, and you all know that I do like tournament fishing, but there's so many other fish out there and there's something giddy when you go saltwater or even to Florida when like you yeah. literally do not know what you're going to hook. Yeah. You don't know. Yeah. And it was weird. Like they come up and their guts are coming out of their mouth and, yep. you know, and then like a couple of times we caught some remora and, you know, you let them go and they don't leave around the boat. They just stay with their mates. And it was like, okay, go away. Cause now I can't catch any fish. We have to go like off to another spot. Cause they, once you catch them, they stay near the surface around you. Um, so I think that's interesting. How did you get a passion for snakehead fishing? Um, I just wanted to do it once to say I did it. And I, I did it. And I was like, oh, that fight was so much fun. And then I just kind of really like, 
focused and, and honed in on it. And then um, I think one time I was out fishing, I was out fishing on the res on Ricky Lambert's boat on his, uh, his boat. And then we ran into Odenkirk um, and he, you know, we exchanged numbers and he said, come out on the boat with us one time while we do electro shocking and our electro fishing. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And there's just so at that time, there was so much negative stuff about snakehead out there. Like, Oh, they're the devil. They're going to eat your children. They walk yeah. they can walk all over the place. And I mean, it was, it was bad. So, um, you know, I started the DMV Northern um, snakehead fishing group to kind of spread awareness there. Usually when I go on the boat for the electro fishing, I, I go live in there so they can ask questions live with John. Um, Cause he's, you know, you've had him on the show. He's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to that. And I think I just really kind of took the stance of like spread the word about what a great fishery, because it is an amazing fish. There's a lot of people that travel here to fish for that. I feel like we're mm -hmm. super lucky to have that here. Um, especially with all the research that's been done since the first one was found in May, 2004, that they're not a, a damage to our ecosystem at all. Um, so to me, I think that that's uh I think it's a, I think it's a bonus and plus that we have them here. Um, I love getting people on them. I have friends that have Dylan um, Lowry, who's on and he's from Georgia. He, I got him on one, um, took him a couple trips, but we were actually able to get him connect on one. So he was super excited about that. Um, so it's just, it's just, you know, I, it's just a fun fish. We don't, there's, they're not all over the place. It's, we're kind of special to have them. So. Do you think they should be protected or there should be some kind of like snakehead stamp? It really does burn me up when I see all the bow fishermen, 30 of them on there. Um, and not only that is that they've blown out a lot of the areas like Pohick was one of the top areas that I could always guarantee to go catch, catch naked in. And then I'll go out the next morning and see all so much hydrilla floating at the top of the water. I know that, you know, they've been back there. Um, I've been back there fishing a tournament um, for KBF actually a couple years ago with Mike Elsie, who's from Indiana. And um, he, we were we were back in this this area that just a little small area that you can get in but with the the radius um that you're not allowed to be around other people in the kayak during a kayak tournament there was no one else that was going to be able to get in there and uh -huh. mike, mike and i kind of did that strategically so he would fish one area and then i would fish the other area well that doesn't stop anybody else from coming in so this these bow fishermen two gentlemen came in and they were just literally right around our boat um, and it got really close to Mike Elsie at one point. And then I started filming cause they were not being very nice. And he was like, Hey, like, dude, like, come on. Like we're fishing a tournament. And at that point he's like, pull, pulled the bow up, his bow up right at, um, at the front of, of Mike's boat. And it was just like, come on, dude. Like, you know, what, what the heck? You don't need to be doing that. Like, that's just ridiculous. Um, so I think that there needs to be some kind of limit on those, um, but I would love to see it become a sport fish. I mean, I think the idea here is that if you catch one, um, <laughs> yes, Josh, that was one of the funniest things ever. Um, if you catch one in, you know, here, the idea is like a double digit is, is the best one to catch, but. And then we, we got to really we call really, them we dragons. And that was the thing too. And then I'll answer this first and I'll, I'll get to my point was Becker. Uh, do you think there will, they will regulate bow fishing eventually? I think. I think a tribe, if a tribe is strong enough, no matter its size, it'll get a voice in Congress and for different governments. And I just know this because I'm on the Black Bass Advisory Board for Maryland, so I get to make policy for 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 largemouth in Maryland. And I know like a, a small group, if they make enough noise, can make changes. And the snakehead tribe is small, but it's very strong. And like you said, like a, a big one's called a dragon. Like there is there is marketing sex appeal with the snakehead unlike any other species compared to like the catfish and things like that. And because it's such a unique fish, the area, I think there's a lot of people, especially with the COVID pandemic that got into fishing specifically to catch a snake. Sweet. Like, and so I do worry about regular, I, I do worry now I'm not really hardcore about putting too many regulations on, but what's going to end up happening is you're gonna have a bow fisherman, one of these Maryland creeks where there's a hundred billion dollar home. Yeah. And they're spotlighting at one in the morning at the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And that's how the regulation is going to come through there because yeah. that, let's be real. That's how the world works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Money talks. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it really does. Yeah. Uh, what's this one here? We got Josh again. Um, it would be amazing if they would reclassify Northern snakehead as a game fish. Imagine the size. Oh, we get mad. And there's still some big that's ones. What out I, there, that's what I, that's what I, I would love for it to get to that point. I would love to get to that point. Maybe I need to start lobbying to make that happen. I don't know. 
I, I think <laughs> it was funny because like Odenkirk is the biggest proponent for that. Honestly, he, is. Like, he absolutely is. And I mean, it's it's amazing to watch. I mean, just even like the spawning of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like um, being able to see them and, and, and how many times they spawn a year and, um, you know, how they protect their fry uh, after they're born. And, you know, that, that's a good chance. I always tell my friends, like, you know, like when Christine Fisher came to fish here, I was like, oh, the fry are out. Like, there's a good chance that we could, you know, get them. If there's parents on the, on the fry ball. Yeah. I mean, and it's so easy, so easy. And, and you miss them once, like with bass are usually gone, but. Snake it, they stay in that in the same area. So we got we got bass hunter. Uh, I just don't think they'll regulate invasive species. I only if the money large was there. Largemouth bass are invasive species. Yeah, largemouth bass are invasive species. Look at Japan, like Japan, like largemouth are invasive species. Like again, it's all about yeah. the money, not about whether it's invasive or not. It's like whether they yeah. can make money off of it. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to catch up on some of these chats here. Uh, got Russ. What is your biggest snakehead? Thirteen and a half. And what is it? Night is nineteen or twenty the world record? I think so. That's not that's not far off. I think it's nineteen. 19. I don't think it's been a twenty yet. No. Damn. Was that on the Potomac or some other special place? That was Potomac. Dang, that's so. Potomac Bay, in about six inches of water. Oh my god. Yeah. How, how do you rig up for them? Is it just like sixty pound braid and just just? No, you them? know what? I used to throw really heavy braid, um, and then I was like, ah, uh, that guess is like kind of a lot, you know. I, I get better casting distance from like a lower size braid. <laughs> So I just throw 20 on and I haven't had any issues. And the reason why I did that is because I broke my frog rod, um, right. I was filming the, the snakehead, uh, video, um, with Chad Hoover and we were trekking our kayaks on wheels, uh, through this remote area that we were going to film. And, um, my kayak kind of hit a, 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 a root and went sideways and I had my rods in the black pack you know, uh, stored. And so when it hit that way, it, it hit a tree and broke. And so I was actually using my chatterbait rod, um, that I had 15 pound fluoro on. And I was actually took some friends out, to, um, that are down from Virginia beach to go fishing. And I was leading him out to this area and I was in front of him and, you know, kind of just moving along with the tide as the tide was pushing in. Um, and you know, there's, there's like that sandy bank before the, the pads all start just, just straight sand. It's usually like five or six feet. And I was letting the tide push me in there and I was casting out in front of me and then reeling back. And as I was, I wasn't paying attention to my frog as I was reeling in, but there was two, like three, four pound bass were just coming towards me to the bow of my kayak. And I was like, Oh man, look at those. And they turned off as soon as I was saying that into the spatter dock. And as soon as I, you know, was looking at them as like, bam, my frog blew up. Cause I wasn't paying attention. I was like this. And that's where I caught my biggest one. So he was chasing those two bass. Um, and I had 15 pound fluoro and he had me wrapped up and, you know, I'm trying to like move through the spatter rock so that that wouldn't break. Cause I was like, this, this is a, this is a big one. This is a, this is a monster. Um, so as soon as he didn't break my 15 pound fluoro um, and he was 13 and a half pounds and it, it took me a, a bit to get him in. And so I was like, I'm just going to run 20 pound braid and I've not had any issues with it. So how did you get him in the boat? Did you have, I mean, you couldn't boat flip him, right? Like, how did you get him? Um, so I use, um, a diver's clip Oh, okay. because they have lock jaw, right? They won't open their mouths. You can't get your bait out. You don't want to stick your hands in your mouth. Like don't ever stick your hands on a snakehead mouth, even if their mouth is open and they, Oh, there's not that bad, bad of teeth. Don't their, their jaws are really, and they do not open it up. you like, you have to get in there and really, um, use some draw spreaders. Um, so I use a diver's clip and, um, it's just like a real thick metal wire that kind of clips at the top. And I stick that in, the, if I'm going to harvest it, I'll stick it in the gills, um, through the gills and then out, out the mouth, sometimes I have to pry it open. And then I, I lock it in. And so that was in the pictures with it, you'll, you'll see it on the diver's clip because the diver's clip is, is, is pretty thick, pretty thick steel. Um, wow. but it helps me be able to handle them. Usually I'll do that with the bigger ones because they can be really calm for a minute. And then when you think they're calm, they'll just spaz out and, and go nuts and flip all over the place. It gets a bit crazy. Joseph just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Message me on Facebook or Instagram to reclaim it. Um, sorry for the typo, but what size and weight does is a snakehead considered a dragon? Um, the size, usually it's, it's definitely going to be over like 30, definitely over 30 inches. Um, but but for, for what we consider dragons is usually over 10 pounds. That's kind of like what, what we say is double digit, it, weight, double digit weight is, is a dragon, which is a big ass snakehead guys. And then yeah. Shane follows that up with the Rappahannock. Does it have snakes? Yes, it does. Absolutely. It's, 
uh, Shane Odenkirk talked about that the last time I think we had him on. He mentioned like the, the rap is going to be putting out some weight here soon because it's behind the Potomac. So it's where the Potomac was a couple of years ago. Yeah. Port Royal is a good spot to get some steak heads. Yeah. Guys, you, you guys are absolutely just smoking the questions here. Good Lord. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Josh is what's cracking? Uh, boo boo. I don't know <laughs> who you're talking to in this comment section right here. You guys are having your own comment conversations right now, which is insane. Uh, let's see. Uh, was with Elsa last year. He was dying when I hooked into a snake. Thought I was a dang bull shark. Dude, <laughs> those things pull so freaking hard. Yes. Um, uh, so Mike didn't catch a snakehead when he went with me, Mike Elsie. And so he told me he caught one last year and he was super excited about it. So yeah, what? Mike's from Indiana. So, you know, good old little, little country boy and finally got on say, and he, and he's fished with me a few times when he's come out here for KBF tournament. So he finally got one last year. What about the snakehead fishing? Like, do you change? Let me rephrase this. How much of your tackle do you change to go from snakehead to bass? Or is it basically the same stuff? Because you said you're just doing 15 pound fluorocarbon. Same. same. No, I did for that time. But oh, okay. I, yeah, I usually told put on 20 to 30 pound braid. Um, I, I, I it's the same. I mean, and I'm I'm pretty predictable. I mean, it's it's a top water, um, you know, Z-Man plastics. Uh, I'm with Z-Man. Um, so like, you know, TRDs or any kind of worms, um, and jackhammers. So I'm a huge jackhammer. I have a whole Plano box just full of jackhammers and I keep it full. I have like this OCD. If it's empty, I start to freak out and I have to get more, <laughs> but, um, I'm just, I'm a big jackhammer fan. So why? Um, I just, I love the thump of it. I could feel it on my rods. I mean, I use, you know, I, I love the, like the cash and chatterbait rod. Um, just, I can feel the action. And it's funny because I went fishing um, with some some of my friends that came up from Virginia Beach, and I just got into and it's just we were we weren't catching a lot of bass. It was it was not a, the right tide, but I got into a hole with a bunch of blue cats, and um, I was just nailing them. And I've got five people around me that I'm friends with, all fishing, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna back off. You guys fish this right, and I'm I'm using a white jackhammer, and they're using they're like, what are you using? I'm like, just you know, chatterbaits, uh, jackhammer. And they're like, we don't have jackhammers. We're just gonna put white um chatterbaits on i'm like okay none of them will catch anything i'm literally like throw it in here this is what you do none of them will catch anything and i was like looked in my box and i have like eight white jackhammers i'm like okay i gave all of them one every single one of them started catching them and so i think that there is mean, to me it's just a difference i mean i i just i it's just my thing i like it and and it's hard to not catch them i think that was one of the top baits at the hobie tournament just this past time at paris chain so I know really? Trey said Trey told me this morning he was he was ripping him up on the on the jackhammer. And I want to add to that. I got Joseph in the comment section here. I know if you don't have Facebook or Instagram, uh, email me fishing the DMV at gmail.com to reclaim your prize. Will the chatterbait ever go into a cycle? Because like the spinnerbait went died for a little while, and we had other things like the swim bait and things like that. But it seems like the chatterbait. It, how the hell are these fish not conditioned to it? Living, hearing and covering about 10,000 Potomac River tournaments, you think these things are the dumbest things in the world because you know what everyone has on their deck or their boat or their kayak. Yeah, yeah they do. Um, I think the trailer makes a difference. I think everybody's retrieves make a difference. You know, my husband just started fishing and I could literally back out of that spot, give him the same bait, give him direction on exactly where to throw and he still won't catch it. So I think that that's just, and, and it's happened with some other folks, you know, same with, you know, my swim jig, I've, 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 that's happened to me, you know, as well. But I think it's, you know, it all comes down to everyone's like, it's like your own personal handwriting and the way that you retrieve, um, you know, certain baits that like one person can't mimic the exact same way that you do it. Um, but uh, trailers make a big difference. I think your cadence makes a big difference. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. But, you know, I've, I've also been really a big fan of the Minimax uh, this year with a smaller profile, just being able to tip off the top of the grass because I do well with the swim jig. And, and so I've kind of went the Minimax way. And I kind of got that. Like, has he tried the Minimax by Crappy Kev? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> what tournaments are you going to be fishing this year? Um, don't know. Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, definitely the Susky tournaments. Cause I, I mean, I can't, I can't not do any of the Susky um, or, and unfortunately the, um, the Shenandoah tournament uh, for MVKBA is on my birthday, which I have plans with my daughter. So 
my daughter's. Um, so I won't be doing that one. So that's a bummer because I always love oh. doing that one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, it, it'll just kind of come down to my daughter's getting married this year. Um, oh. So there's, yeah, just as long as there's no conflict with that and work, um, I'll be as many as I can. I don't, I don't think I'll be doing many Hobie ones because a lot of them are really far away. Um, but I, I hope to do some more of the, the BASS ones and, and then almost, if not all of the local ones. So, Do you have any thoughts in the next couple of years of like hitting the, the Hobie trail or the bass trail and traveling a little bit more? Has that ever crossed your mind? Um, yeah. I mean, I do hit them. Um, I just don't do all of them. Um, I'm not going for AOI. I really just do it because um, I, it's, it's really fun for me to obviously fish, uh, but I catch up with a lot of the friends from all over the country that I don't get to see as often. Um, and, you know, we all get in a house together and, you know, it's, it, you learn from others and that's always fun for me. Um, but, you know, for me, I'm, I, you know, I'm the, I'm the breadwinner of the house and I'm also the mom and the wife that has to cook dinner and clean the house and take care of these big, great Danes. And so it's harder for me to get away. Um, you know, you, I know the men, you guys have to ask permission, but you, you got your ladies taking care of everything at home. And, but that's me, I'm the lady that has to take care of things at home. So as long as I can get away and, and make sure everything's, you know, taken care of, I know my, my husband and, and, and my kids are going to be door dashing that whole time I'm gone. But, um, other than that, yeah, as long as it aligns with, you know, with my home, my home schedule, it works pretty good. And the, and the, and the local ones are a lot easier for me, but. Oh. When you say about home and local, uh, will will the will other kayak tournament trails besides you know MVKBA ever give more love to the Shenandoah and the Upper Potomac? Because the Upper Potomac, especially, is, is on fire now. It's really good. MVKBA was great for Upper Potomac. Well, Upper Bay. Sorry, I don't know how much of Upper Potomac. Yeah, like the Let small mouth version. On that one. Yeah, for for the people that are um, that don't know, I'm talking about the small mouth portion of the yeah, uh, yeah, Upper Potomac like, River. Algonquian and yeah, uh, Algonquian, I think uh, uh, Rich lives up. I'm Rich. Uh, Josh lives up near um, Brunswick, Maryland. Yep, Little Seneca area. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, of course your Front Royal area, because um, I, I think that's like it's a prime area to have more tournaments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Susky is just still my favorite. I mean, to okay. be honest with you, I've I've caught. That's a different league. <laughs> I caught a sixteen ounce, uh, sixteen inch smallmouth that rivaled any pre-spawn largemouth out here i mean it was 16 inches i pulled it out of the water and i'm like what what are you supposed to be like you look like you totally got compacted it was it was just super odd um you know and just fishing those islands and it's it's fun i i, I will not pass up a trip on the susky all right, guys, we're going to be, uh, I don't want to be here. We're not going to be here all night. This is not one of these, those type of podcasts. We're going to get through this. What's up, so, uh, look, Hi, uh, look at podcasting at work. Awesome. Stick right there. Uh, let's see. Thanks, got a couple more questions. I got, we got a, uh, another, here we go. Got another gift card winner, Peter. Uh, what is your best advice to people new to kayak tournament fishing? Peter, you just want a gift card to Jake's paint and tackle. My best advice is don't fall into what your neighbor has next to you. Um, just because they have some super cool rigged up kayak with all these things on it doesn't mean you need that. I mean, demo the boat before you buy it. If you can't demo, if the, if the dealer does not have one for you to demo, join one of your local groups, ask any of them if they could demo, if you could demo one of their boats, if there's a particular one that you're looking at. But you do not need to have every accessory that's out there. Put some time in your boat. Um, see what works for you. Um, I've been doing this for a long time and I can tell you, I've put rod holders on my boat. I've moved rod holders on my boat. I've removed rod holders on my boat and I change it all the time. So um, it's, it's the, the beauty of kayak fishing is that you can make it your own and you can change it whenever you want, but you don't have to go out and, you know, it can get really expensive just dumping a bunch of stuff in there. And there's a lot of people that do that. But if you have the ability to buy a used kayak that has all that stuff on there, that's also a great deal too. Cause it, there are some great deals, especially after tournament season, people will sell their whole, whole rigs with trailers and motors included. I do think it's interesting where like the prices are starting to creep up there guys. And, and this is not the show for that about that, but will there be a price ceiling? Because now you're looking at kayaks that are like $20,000 completely rigged out. It's like, God damn, that's a tracker boat. That's insane. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, we well, first, I mean, you're getting like dual like monitor electronics on there. You're getting, you know, great motor, three horsepower motors on them and, you know, full accessory. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 you can buy an escort. 
I don't even know if they make those anymore, where you could buy a Mercedes, right? They're both cars. They're both going to get you there. It's just which one's more comfortable and which one has more features. It's it's li literally the same thing. It's just it's falling into the kayak world. We got Matthew just won a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Uh, what kayak uh, is she using on the Susquehanna? I use my Jackson Nar. Uh, it's a 14 foot, uh, almost 14 feet. Um, it's, it's a big, it's a big monster, but uh, I, I use it on there. I, I am wanting to get a smaller, more river boat looking at, at one of the Kusa, Jackson Kusas to be able to, to maneuver a little bit faster through some of the rapids, um, especially like on the Doe and the areas that I fish, I need to be able to, to turn a bit faster. So I'm looking for a lighter, smaller boat. Mm. Just haven't decided which, which Jackson be, um, one I want to go with yet. Let's see. We got Thomas. What, what kayak are you fishing out of this year? Uh, I bought a Torquedo. Then I realized I think I have a hole in the kayak I have. So we are going back to the drawing board. If you guys don't know, I'm fishing MVKBA this year. I'm signing up for that. I'm sponsoring them a little bit more. Um, so I bought the motor, but I don't have the boat now. So we're going to figure that out. We still got a month and a half. So How big is your hole? It's easy to fix. Uh, it's about the size of a softball. Oh, okay. Never mind. So apparently I probably pulled it out of the truck with a little bit too much vigor at the at the Sleater's Lake. So Jeez. we got time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, Becker, uh, do you get a lot of short strikes on your jackhammer? And he follows it up with another question about a trailer hook. Do you ever use one? I don't use a trailer hook anymore. No, <laughs> no, that's just another place for me to get snagged on and I fish with grass. <laughs> so no. Um, it, what was the other one? Uh, it was about the, the jackhammer. Do you get a lot of short strikes on it? And if you do, how do you remedy that? Mm, not really. Uh, but for me, like I would get a lot of short, uh, short strikes on my swim jigs. Like if I was using like a crawl, so I would just shorten the crawl just to make it a smaller trailer. Just, it's, you know, do you I like, like crawl baby. trailers? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for, um, for my jackhammers, I use a razor shad a lot. Okay. Yeah. Or the new chatter spikes. Time. I have all the new chatter spikes, so I'll be using those a lot this year from Z-Man. And you're going to have to bring those to the, um, and then Josh, actually, this is a great segue question. Thank you, Josh. But uh, this kind of segues into this. Uh, you got to be bringing some yeah. of that tackle to the fishing expo that we have going on. So if you guys don't know, um, there's going to be a, a kayak fishing expo. Uh, I had this brainchild of like, instead of just doing like a car pimp out show, why don't you just come show off your pimped out kayaks? We're going to have categories yeah. this year. Come check it out. You're going to be a guest speaker. Uh, we're going to have a couple other guest speakers. I guess Mike and I are supposed to figure that out. So Josh is too, actually. Yep. Josh Definitely is going to be there. Watcher, yeah. Um, yeah. It's and Jake's is now a Jackson kayak dealer. Yep. So yep, yep, yep. We have had, we have some other Jackson kayak dealers that are in the Northern Virginia area. Um, but most of them are rental, um, you know, rental uh, dealers that kind of do float trips on the water, but this is an official first kayak uh, Jackson dealer um, and, and tackle shop in Northern Virginia. So I'm so excited that Jake's is now part of the Jackson family and uh, to bring that to everybody who's fishing in the DMVWB area because <laughs> they're very close to West Virginia as well. So, and so, and, and, and just, Kind of piggybacking on what you guys said in the comment section. So if you want to, uh, February 24th, come on out. You can take a look at all the cool uh, kayaks. There's there's going to be a ton of kayaks on display, people showing off their kayaks to win prizes. But you can also talk to some of these legendary anglers to get their opinions on kayak setups, uh, Jackson in particular. So it should be an absolute blast. Yeah. Um, Myself and Josh Evans, who's also on the, on the Jackson team. I think um, Matt Campbell, um, also on the Jackson team, we're, we'll be there. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. And then we do have a question about the Kusa, just like what is the, is, is the Kusa like a river kayak or just what is the deal with the Kusa is basically the question. So there's several Kusas. Um, there's the Kusa HD, Kusa FD, and that's, so that's just a regular drive or, uh, you know, a pedal paddle kayak. And then the FD is the, is the flex drive. And then there's the Kusa X, which is more of like a river platform. So, it, you know, you could put a motor on it. Um, if you were at the Jake's kayak show last year, you probably saw uh, Josh Evans extremely very cool pimped out Kusa X. Um, so he had his electronics on there. He had his motor on there. Um, I'm not sure if he's bringing it all out. I, I believe he got a another color. 
Um, I'm not sure if it, hopefully he'll have it all pimped out for uh, for the Jake's event, but uh, that's that's a fantastic platform to to have uh, for a river, and so that's one of the ones that I'm looking for. Oh, and he has that extremely very nice yellow and black and white pimped out Kusa X for sale um, since he upgraded just because of his color. Um, so if you're looking for something like that, feel free to uh, reach out to Josh Evans. There you guys go. So in less than, I guess, actually in a month's time, guys, we're going to have that uh, kayak show. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to throw in an advertisement and stuff for that. And of course, that'll be live streamed by yours truly. Um, my God, we covered a lot of stuff. We have 60 people on Facebook and YouTube, and we have 20 people on Instagram watching right now, guys. Thank you for such a great show. People yeah. say people aren't going to watch in January. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, I don't. Oh, I remember. This is, guys, why I always have a notepad up here, because the one thing I want to make sure we talked about was Table Rock. Um, there's a couple things coming up with Women's Fishing uh, Federation. I want to make sure that you we had a chance to talk about that. Yeah. So um, if you're not familiar and you are a woman that is looking to get into fishing, if you're local, definitely reach out to me. I'd be happy to take you out whether you have a kayak or not. I will happily supply you with one. Um, and if you are looking to get out into the female fishing community, um, I do work with Women's Fishing Federation. Um, you can check them out at womensfishingfederation.org. Uh, we we do an annual event every year, a different location. We've done Lacrosse, Wisconsin, Lake Fork, Texas, Louisville, Kentucky, or um, Indiana, but right outside of Louisville. Um, and this year we'll be at Table Rock in Missouri. Um, dates and actual location um, TBD. Um, there's also going to be, um, I think, believe a saltwater fishing experience event, um, which will be our first saltwater event for um, for our organization. And then there's will be a West Coast fishing experience event that sometime all TBD, um, but to occur in 2024. And then if people would like to follow you on your kayaking exploits, uh, I want to, there you go. Oh, Carly, come on, bring it on girl. <laughs> Even my wife wants to get into this thing now. Let's go. Um, if people want to follow you on your exploits, where can they follow you? Scylla Johnson fishing. And yep. then as always guys, link in the episode description to all that. Um, I got nothing else. Do you got anything else that you'd like to plug or anything you want to talk about? Nothing. Yeah. I mean, I'm always available. If you hit me up on, on social media, I'm happy to answer any questions or if you want to go fishing, hit me up. Thanks again so much for coming on the show. I'm so glad we finally got this to work. Um, guys, as always with the Monday night live streams, uh, I'm taking this thing down to check the audio, polish everything up, and then it'll be re-uploaded for Spotify, Apple, iHeart, YouTube on Wednesday morning. So don't worry if you've missed this. I'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.